Welcome to Lesson 2 of Finding the Messiah Jesus in the Feast of Israel in the Gospel of John. Today we're going to look at the Passover, meeting Messiah in the Feast of Passover, or Pesach. As the feasts are mentioned in John, three Passovers are covered, chapter 2, chapter 6, and then the third Passover takes up chapter 11, verse 55 through 1942. Let's take a moment and look at those scriptures. If you'd like to look along with me, John chapter 11, verse 55, And the Jews' Passover was nigh at hand, and many went out of the country up to Jerusalem before the Passover to purify themselves. A key scripture. It was near at hand. They went up not only to the Passover, but before the Passover to purify themselves. So, we can know and mark this as the starting point, John 11:55. For the third Passover in the life of Jesus. Now if we turn all the way over to chapter 19, in chapter 19 verse 42, there laid they Jesus, therefore because of the Jews preparation for the sepulcher was nigh at hand. Many people look at this as the day of preparation of the Sabbath, but the Passover is also a Sabbath. In fact, it's a high Sabbath. So we can look at Jesus dying on the eve of Passover, on Passover, and uh, we had the Lord's Supper on the preparation of that day, and we'll not get into the numerology of the days and nights, of three days and three nights at this point, but we can see that chapter 19, verse 42, marks the end of what would have been the Feast of Passover. So we have chapter 12, chapter 13, chapter 14, chapter 15, chapter 16, chapter 17, chapter 18, and chapter 19 of the Gospel of John, eight full chapters devoted to one feast of Israel in and around the temple area, and therefore Jesus came not only in the fullness of time, but in the fullness of type, and in this case, the type of the Passover. So as we go back to looking at the feast of Israel, of course, the feast of Passover is the first of the religious ceremonial feast. It's the first day, the first month of the year, uh, and the 14th day of the month. So the disciples made ready the Passover, Scripture says. Peter and John went to the temple. Remember, they had walked 75 miles from up in the Galilee region. And so they've come by themselves. They could not have had lambs that they brought all this way for all of them. It would have been customary to go to the money changers in the temple and to change your money, but to buy and sell lambs, doves, pigeons, whatever the holiday required. And Peter and John went to the temple, and they purchased a lamb, and then they presented it to be slain. Then the blood was offered by the priest. Then they took the lamb and prepared it and roasted it, or had someone to prepare and roast it along the way as they went from the temple back up to the upper room in the area known as Mount Zion. Scripture says in Exodus chapter 12, verse 14, This day shall be unto you for a memorial, and you shall keep it a feast to the Lord, throughout your generations. You shall keep it a feast by an ordinance forever. So there's the Exodus Passover in chapter 12, and then there's the perpetual Passover. And Jewish people are to keep the Passover forever. Often I'm asked the question, should a Jewish person continue to keep the Passover uh, after they receive Jesus as their Messiah and Savior? When I ask the question, Numbers of people in the audience will answer no and shake their head no. And then I'll remind them that Jesus commanded us to keep, as often as we keep this feast, Corinthians says, uh, to do it in memory of our Lord. At least they would have done it annually. So yes, a Jewish person should continue to keep the Passover. In fact, we as believers in Jesus, adopted into the family of God, continue to keep the Feast of Passover. It was the Last Supper, the Last Seder, the Last Passover dinner not as some means to obey the law to enter heaven. That wasn't the purpose of the feast at all. But to continue as a commemoration, just as the full Jewish Passover Seder is a commemoration of the exodus deliverance, we keep the communion as Christ's deliverance of us through his shed blood and broken body. So the three Egypt Passover elements were lamb, unleavened bread, and bitter herbs. Nothing else is added but those. Roasted lamb, roast by fire, to eat all of it, to leave nothing left until the morning. Unleavened bread and bitter herbs. 
In the tenth day of the month, they shall take unto them every man a lamb, and shall keep it up until the fourteenth day of the same month. The blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where you are. When I see the blood, I will, it doesn't say pass over you. Uh, the plague shall not be nigh upon you to destroy you. When I was a young kid, I would think of God passing over that house in the sense that he would skip that house. That's not at all what scripture is saying here. God is saying, I will pass over you, and the plague shall not come upon you to destroy you. God would prevent the plague because of his presence. The first promise of eternal security, we can see there in that Passover. And thus shall ye eat it with your loins girded, your shoes on your feet, and your staff in your hand, and ye shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. What is the Lord's Passover? The unleavened bread? The bitter herbs? No, in fact, the lamb is God's Passover. They were to eat the Passover. And they shall take of the blood and strike it upon the two side posts and upon the upper door post of the houses. So they were to make ready the Passover. In the first Passover, as noted in John chapter 2, verse 23, it says, when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover. He didn't live in Jerusalem. He traveled to Jerusalem from the area of Capernaum on the Sea of Galilee as one of the three feasts per year that young males 20 years old and upward would have to attend. When he was in Jerusalem at the Passover in the feast day. And so that's a very specific day, the first day of the seven day feast uh, when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover season, it was actually on that feast day. Chapter 6, verse 4, and the Passover, the feast of the Jews, was nigh. And then in chapter 11, 55 and 56, says the Jews' Passover was nigh at hand. And chapter 12, verse number 1, then Jesus six days before the Passover came to Bethany. Chapter 13, verse number 1, now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour was come. Chapter 18, verse 39, But ye have a custom that I should release unto you one at the Passover, Pilate said. And then chapter 19, verse 31 and 42, Because it was the preparation that the body should not remain upon the cross, for that Sabbath day was an high day. It's not talking about Saturday the Sabbath, but Passover. There laid they Jesus, therefore, because of the Jews' preparation day, for that Sabbath was an high day. Often people confuse the, the timing of Jesus' crucifixion without getting into all the details of that, of having to happen on Good Friday because it was for, before the Sabbath. John makes it very clear that this was a high Sabbath. A high Sabbath is not just a Saturday that was a more special Saturday than others, although sometimes Passover could land on a Saturday. It'd be a double Sabbath. But every Passover was a high day, and every Passover was a Sabbath in which no work was to be done. So they made ready the Passover. They purchased the lamb. They presented it. The blood was offered. They took the lamb, prepared it, and roasted it, or had it roasted. Cestius took a lamb census for Nero, which gave an accounting of 265,500 Passover lambs that were offered. Imagine if 10 people in a household or a couple of households shared a lamb. Imagine how many people times 10 that would be. 2.5, 2.6 million people coming to Jerusalem at Passover. It was no mistake that God chose that Jesus would come in the fullness of time, made of a woman, a Jewish woman, a virgin woman, made under the law of Moses, and it was also no mistake that he came in the fullness of type at the actual Levitical festival and that he became our Passover lamb at the Jewish Passover when so many people would be present to see, to hear about it, and to know what happened. As we look back into the last Passover of Jesus in the book of Matthew, it says, As they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it and break it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. In John 13, 18, Jesus said, I speak not of you all. I know whom I have chosen, but that the scripture might be fulfilled. He that eateth bread with me hath lifted up his heel against me. Psalm 41, verse number 9 was where that was quoted from. 
Jesus at the Passover said, this is my body. Now there are four cups or sips of cups in the Seder, the Passover dinner, by Jesus' time, added by tradition of the rabbis. The first two are the cup of sanctification and the cup of praise. The fourth cup is the cup of acceptance. The third cup, which Jesus took and instituted as one of the two ordinances of the church, the third cup was the cup of redemption. These cups, the third and the fourth cups, are seen in the book of Luke. You might wonder why no pastor ever uses the book of Luke at the Lord's Supper. We use Matthew, primarily Matthew chapter 26, or we go to Corinthians, how Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us, and how that we are to be pure and examine ourselves. Why is it that no one ever uses Luke 22? I, for years as a pastor myself, never used it, never thought about using it, because it just wasn't as clear and concise as Matthew, I concluded. But as I began to study the scripture and the actual comparison of Matthew with the book of Luke, we read that Jesus took the cup and he gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I say unto you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God shall come. Jesus refused the cup of acceptance, the cup saying, We are ready to accept the Messiah. But he gave it to those who had accepted him. How do we know this? Well, he said, take it and divide it among yourselves. That's take this cup and drink every drop that's in it. By the way, leave enough for uh, the last disciple, for him to take it, for everyone to partake of this cup. Uh, divide it completely among yourselves. One cup divided into 12 sips. And there was none left for Jesus. He did not intend to drink this cup because it says, Likewise, also the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you. Without naming the four cups that were in use by tradition of the rabbis before the time of Jesus, two cups are mentioned in the book of Luke. I always ask rhetorically when I'm presenting Christ in the Passover to a congregation, So then, are we to have two cups and one bread at communion? Have we been missing out? No, not at all. In fact, it's very clear from the other scriptures that Jesus said, take this cup, this cup, and this bread represents his body and his blood that was shed. So what are the two cups here? The last two cups of the four that are mentioned, first of all, there was a cup of praise, the cup of sanctification, then the cup of praise, then the cup of acceptance is fourth, then the cup of redemption. I contend that Jesus took the fourth cup before the third cup and said, you who have accepted me, drink this cup of acceptance and divide it among yourselves, for I will not drink of this cup until the kingdom of God shall come. It would have been hypocritical for Jesus at his last Passover to drink the cup of acceptance after the national leaders of Israel, the chief priests and Pharisees and scribes, had rejected him and turned him over already to be betrayed by Judas and to be crucified at the hands of Pilate and the Roman centurion. Jesus refused to take the cup of acceptance, but his disciples were commanded to receive it because they had accepted him. And then you have a second cup mentioned in Luke chapter 22. Likewise also the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. Typically the third cup in the order of the Seder is the cup of redemption, signifying, commemorating the blood of the Lamb of the Passover at Exodus. In this case, Jesus changed the object of that symbol to, from himself to the lamb. So here Jesus says, take this cup. This is shed for you. Very interesting when we study the Gospel of John and this Passover in the context of the Jewish festivals. Now, there's an overlooked origin of the cup at the Passover table. The origin of the cups being part of the Passover is not found in the book of Exodus. It's found in Jewish tradition. In the Exodus Passover, only three elements were required to be perpetually included in the annual commemorative observance. They were lamb, bitter herbs, and unleavened bread. Yet Jesus took a totally rabbinic fabricated tradition of the juice, not found in Exodus, 
representing the lamb's blood and made it one of only two items inaugurated in the ordinance of communion at the Last Supper. Thus the significance of Matthew 23, 2 and 3, which we read previously. The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. All, therefore, whatsoever they bid you observe, that observe and do, but do not after their works, for they say and do not. Jesus did not drink the first cup in Luke, the cup of his acceptance because Israel's leaders rejected him. His disciples had accepted him, so they divided among themselves. Jesus said, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God shall come. These cups were not found in the book of Exodus. They were totally of rabbinic traditional origin. Yet Jesus took one of the two ordinances of the church, not from any text of scripture. Or we can say he, he drank this cup. We read about it in the gospels. But in Luke, we see two cups. And when you understand the history, we understand there were four cups. These four cups, the two cups, not even one cup was found in the book of Exodus. So Jesus took an, something of rabbinic origin that was a wonderful tradition of remembering the lamb's blood that was the symbol of, that they had placed their faith in God. And it was the blood that atoned for the soul. And God became the Passover and the lamb became the Passover. And in this case, Jesus was to become the Passover lamb. For that to happen, the national leaders of Israel must reject him. Therefore, Jesus would not drink one of the two cups mentioned in Luke that we know to be the cup of acceptance, but rather instituted the third cup, which is the cup of redemption, as a part of our Lord's Supper or our communion. He came into his own and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Now before I move on from this scripture, let's make something very clear. Jesus came to his own. As we read that through Gentile eyes, throughout most of my life growing up, I read that as he came to the Jewish people and the Jewish people didn't receive him. But as many Gentiles who received him, to them gave he power. That's not at all what this scripture is saying. Oh, it is saying to anyone who believed he gave them the power to become the son of God through simple faith in his name. That's true. But when he came into his own and his own received him not, we need to study scripture very clearly because we can do actual accounting in the book of Acts of 3,000 being saved, then 5,000 being saved, and then that multi multitude being multiplied greatly. And then a great company of the chief priests and the Pharisees believed. And on and on it goes until they had filled Jerusalem with this doctrine. The early apostles were accused of turning the world upside down. The uh, existing rulers and chief priests and Pharisees were afraid that the whole world was going after them and following them. So apparently many of Jesus' own Jewish brethren did receive him, not only apparently, Factually, we can prove that from Scripture. So notice what this says. He came unto his own Jewish nation, and his own Jewish nation or national leaders received him not. Or we could even go back to his first uh, sermon in his synagogue in Nazareth. His own family and townsfolks took him out to the brow of the hill, and they were going to cast him off because he said he fulfilled the prophecy of the Messiah that he read in Isaiah. So that's the first thing that happened in his ministry. His own townsfolks and even some of his own family refused to believe and received him not. And then we come to the end of his three and a half year ministry and his own national leaders received him not. But between those two parentheses, we see a great host, but as many Jews as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, not only to the Jews, even to them, to others who believe on his name. So it's very important for us to read this scripture and not say, well, the Jews rejected him, but we received him. As if we were smarter, they were more evil, they had no faith, we had faith. That's not all the case. As we look at scripture, we see as many Jewish brethren of his own received him, he saved them and even to others, to them that believe on his name. So after the Passover, in Matthew chapter 26, it says they sang a hymn and they went out into the Mount of Olives. This might have been a, 
similar view or pathway that they took without the mosque there as they descended from Mount Zion, quite uh, a descent, and down to this level area and around the wall of Jerusalem to the right and down the steep valley. And when Jesus had spoken these words, he went forth with his disciples over the brook Kidron. The teachings of Jesus in John 14 to 17 take us on an immense, take on, let me back up. The teachings of Jesus in John 14 through 17 take on immense significance in the light of the Passover. All of these teachings happened on their descent from the upper room on Mount Zion around the southern wall of Jerusalem across the Kidron Valley to the Garden of Gethsemane in which John quotes where was a garden into which he entered and his disciples, John 18, 1. And they came to a place which was named Gethsemane and he saith to his disciples, Sit ye here while I shall pray. What a wonderful place to go. I hope that you can go with us on our tours to Israel. Jesus taught that he would be slain as a shepherd, giving his life for his sheep. In the context, in previous scriptures, around the time of the second year of his ministry, in the second Passover, in John 8, 28, Jesus said unto them, When ye have lifted up the Son of Man, then ye shall know that I am he. And that I do nothing of myself, but as my Father hath taught me, I speak these things. John 8, 39, they answered and said unto him, Abraham is our father. Jesus said unto them, If you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. But now you seek to kill me, a man that hath told you the truth, which I have heard of God, this did not Abraham. And John 10, 15 and 17, As the Father knoweth me, even so I know the Father, and I lay my life down for the sheep. Therefore doth my Father love me, because I lay down my life, that I might take it again. Yes, Christ, Messiah, Jesus, is our Passover, who is sacrificed for us. John devoted part or all of 11 chapters to Jesus being Israel's Passover. And then he concluded the book by saying, These are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name.